Tennessee Wildcast is live on the air with the latest on hunting, fishing, boating, and all things outdoors. Make welcome your host, drummer and outdoor expert novice, Jason Harmon. Hello, hello everybody and welcome to this edition of Tennessee Wildcast. We're glad you're tuning in. And uh, we got an awesome show for you today. Mr. Don King is with us today. He's helping me co-host. How are you, Don? Good, Jason. How are you doing today? I'm doing real good. Good to see you. Good to have you in studio. Uh, good to be talking about fishing today. Yeah, excited about what we're going to be talking about. Even though hunting season's around the corner, uh, it's time to talk a little fishing because of uh, the uh, fishing regs comment periods coming around and I want to get let everybody know about that. That's right. Yeah, we want to get everybody's input and uh, also, I mean, there's a lot of great, you know, fall fishing coming up. So, so just want to, you know, remind everybody to get out there and take part. Yep. A lot of opportunities this time of year. And, uh, and we have today, Mr. Jason Henniger. He is the assistant chief of the fisheries division. How are you doing, Jason? Doing well. Thanks for having me today. Yeah. Glad you're here and uh, excited about, um, uh, what we're going to talk about with you today, but first we want to talk a little bit about uh, some things that's going on in the fisheries world. Uh, one that happened a little while back, uh, a new crappie record, a uh, black crappie, um, but possibility, that's a state record for sure, but a possibility a world record. Can you elaborate on that just a little bit? Yeah, Lionel Ferguson um, caught a 5.7 pound black crappie and that was verified through genetic sampling that we did here at the agency. And uh, he's moving forward uh, with the uh, process of making sure that that's the world record as well, uh, GFA world record. So awesome. we're excited about that to add another world record to the, uh, the list in Tennessee. So. Yeah, and that was caught on a private, private lake in a uh, private pond in Loudoun uh, County, so, or Loudoun, Tennessee. So anyway, um, some people, you know, don't like that, but that's okay. Well, we have a lot of controversy over private versus public lakes, but uh, anytime you can grow a uh, state record size fish or even a world record size fish, it's not an easy task. Uh, we grow a lot of fish in our hatcheries, but we we seldom see any fish, uh, and us feeding them every day, right. very seldom see fish that would be a state record. Mm. Uh, a few in our trout hatcheries, uh, but... Uh, it's a really hard thing to do with all the all the disease and the life uh, span of these fish being fairly short. It's it's extremely hard to do, and it should be recognized. Uh, the state record program is really not a competition. A lot of people like that those bragging rights. Yeah. But uh, it's really just a way to to say, okay, here's the biggest fish in Tennessee. Here's where they're caught, um, and we're proud of what we produce in in the state of Tennessee. So. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Uh, we're going to be talking a lot about what's going on, or what just happened in the commission meeting here the other week, and uh, that's going to be a lot of the topic today. But also we wanted to discuss um, uh, what's biting right now. Uh, if somebody wants to go out and start fishing today and throughout the next week or two, and uh, it's starting to cool off a little bit, but what are they going to be catching? What are they going to be chasing this time of year? Well, I think uh, bass fishing uh, kind of gets hard during the summer with the, the warmer temperatures and and a lot of the boat traffic and, and recreational boating that goes on. But bass fishing should start to pick up uh, with cooler water temperatures. Shads should start to come back shallow and uh, stay there a little bit, and a little bit longer during the day, and those bass will follow those, those shad back in. Um, been hearing of some white bass and, and striper catches. Uh, it's been kind of tough this year with the cooler water temperatures we had that extended farther into spring and then all of a sudden it got hot on us and mm -hmm. uh, water temps came up and, and fishing got tough pretty quick but uh, it should start to, to pick back up as those water temperatures cool this fall so and Don was taking some notes earlier there was interesting stuff going on at the commission meeting uh, pretty cool stuff on habitat that we're doing on some of the uh, agency lakes yeah that's right the uh, the director uh, the southeast south central regional high school director of Bass Nation uh, made a presentation and was able to tell the commission and uh, all all who were watching uh, about about a five thousand uh, dollar award that uh, that we will be able to use and, and grant back out to to volunteer groups to help help uh, improve habitat in our, in our lakes. Yeah, Mr. Jake Davis, um, he's part of that uh, 
BASS nation uh, for Tennessee there and leads that high school uh, regional group uh, down there uh, around Tim's Ford Reservoir and Woods. And they've done a lot of great work, and we've worked with those guys for many years down there. Um, but uh, they received a $5,000 conservation grant from AFCO and BASS, uh, BASS, uh, and uh, we're planning to put that toward uh, furthering that that project there on Tim's board and, and possibly Woods as well. Uh, they can stretch their dollars a lot farther and uh, with the volunteer help of, of fishing groups and, and a lot of um, civic groups, Boy Scouts, uh, TWRA is able to do a lot more uh, across the board, but especially with fish habitat. It was amazing with all hands on deck how much they were able to accomplish in a day that yeah. probably would have taken our guys, you know, weeks yeah. to accomplish just just with the number of hours in a day we've got the boats we've got uh the experience and the and the personnel to to put it where we need it uh-huh. but we a lot of times we don't have the, the hands that that it takes to really put those those structures together and do it in an efficient and, and short time period yeah and if anybody's interested in the details tune in the uh the commission meeting from last week i think you'd be be impressed with with what he was able to show us TWRA has been working on reservoir habitat, fish habitat for uh, probably since the late 60s, early 70s. And uh, I gave a presentation at the previous commission meeting um, about our program and what we do mm-hmm. and, and how we do that. And we're, we're looking to update our website with uh, a lot of the details of what habitats we found that work and what, what don't. Uh, also, uh, we will be updating uh, the website with the the processes of how you you go about getting approval to put habitat in into the reservoirs our reservoirs are managed by the u.s army corps of engineers and Uh and tva and they both have processes where you get a permit to to put those structures in and uh, we can't forget that we have to get approval to do that right get a lot of questions point. on Facebook, too, about uh, can we spray this or that and, and control the grass here and there, and people are upset about certain areas, grass growing and stuff like that. So make sure you contact the core and TVA, right? And also TDEC. And uh, a lot of the herbicide spraying is, is controlled through TDEC, So Okay. All right. Well, speaking of the commission meeting, uh, we're going to talk about a lot of stuff or most of the stuff that was discussed at the commission meeting last week or a week before last, and uh, – and, uh, start out with uh, the main reason we're here uh, fish proposals um, and how you can comment uh, on what we've proposed and what you might like to see happening in the fisheries of Tennessee so uh, I've got a slide I'll throw it up but Jason fill us in on how someone can comment uh, when it comes to the comment period okay our comment period for fishing is a little different than that for wildlife Uh, we put forth a comment period in usually first of April and that runs through mid-May and that's kind of open to the public and it, it's they can comment on anything they want to comment on uh, send us in what what they want to see uh, what they think will make fishing better uh, and benefit the state of Tennessee for regulations and we take all those comments and I personally put those together in a booklet and get those out to our fisheries managers and we sat down in june four of those right four across the state fisheries yes managers. across the state we've got four um our four regional project managers and then we also have uh, all the most of the fisheries biologists the upper level fisheries biologists some of the technicians will usually attend that biologist meeting each okay. year and that's usually uh, mid-may june time frame and we sit down and we talk about that for three days and we talk about anything that our guys bring to the table, regulations that we want to propose. We get that together, and then we present that to the commission at the August meeting, um, which was our, our last meeting where we presented that. And the proposals we come out with during that meeting then goes back to the public for their comment again. It's a very short comment period, only two to three weeks, because we have to turn that around uh, for the final presentation to the commission for their approval, uh, then in in September. So, so we got the close of business day on September fourteenth, correct? Yes. Yeah. And uh, and if you want to mail in your comments, you can do that. If you want to uh, email the comments, that's uh, 
that's welcomed as well. Um, and if you're watching on the on YouTube or Facebook, you can see it's uh, Fish Comments, TWRA Fisheries Management Division. That's P.O. Box 40747, Nashville, Tennessee, 37204. And then if you want to email, that's fishingreg.com. So it's fishingreg. I said .com. I'm sorry. Fishingreg.comments <laughs> at tn.gov. Fishingreg.comments at tn.gov. And that yeah. email is tied into my direct email, and I see those daily. Any, okay. I can go to those. And, that's and good to know. That is the best way to get your comments in. Uh, we, Like I said, we do accept them from the mail, and, and we'll even take a phone call and, and try our best to get your comment down and get it included. Uh, we try to include the comments from the uh, Facebook comments, but that's a little difficult at times to get those printed and, yeah. and all gathered up. So if you really want your comments heard, that email is the best way to get that in there. And so you don't miss it, put fish comments in the subject line so yes. it's easy to spot yeah. when you you're going through all your yeah. your that, emails that helps a lot yeah and make sure that your your comment is not in the subject line we do get that evident every once in a while we'll get that and uh -huh. i understand it with cell phones today a lot of people yeah. are using those can be difficult but uh fish comments in the subject line your comment in the email and and we'll definitely get that in the book that book will uh, go to both our fisheries managers and the commission we provide that to each commission member as well so they have those comments and they know what the public's thinking so. and you can reach out to your commissioners too if you have some things in your area that you want to talk to, talk to them about or um, they're welcome to they, they welcome calls and, and emails and we're glad to talk with you one other reminder that just just came to mind about the uh, setting the regulations that we've we've embarked on an, uh, or the commission has decided to go with a two-year cycle now so these regs will be set end of September uh, by the commission. And when will the next time be that they will, uh, barring, barring uh, an emergency or something that they have to deal with, you know, on a case-by-case -case basis, but just the normal run of things, will that be two years then after that, Jason? It will be, uh, I believe fishing will be at, back up in two years after this period. We've, okay. We've had to juggle that a little bit um, uh, we may be we just finished hunting they did hunting this year they did fishing this year actually we will be back up next back year. up and then on the and two year cycle yes, and then okay so hunting will go on a two two year cycle first and then we will go on uh, after next year so we are back up next year for uh, comments and regulation changes and then it'll be we'll start that two years and those will alternate i guess yes. at that once those get on that schedule they'll alternate and you'll hear uh, the fishing proposals and the hunting proposals every other every, year. Uh, yeah, every if we other do year. have a pressing issue, uh, we can bring that to the commission at any time, and those changes can be made. Uh, it's not that we're we want to try to stay on that two-year cycle with the bulk of the changes, mm -hmm. but if we have an emergency, we can come to the commission at any time. I think they've they're going to allow us to to have that yeah. flexibility because we'll have to print the guide each each year because dates will yes. change and all that kind of stuff. So you got to reprint those and if there's something that needs to be changed uh, we will address that and i just want to remind everyone the guide is not the book the the bible for fish regulations <laughs> oh uh, it's not no it is not they, <laughs> there is changes to be made each year and there's there's mistakes that that happen there if if you really want to know exactly what that regulation is you need to go back to that proclamation the sport fish the bait the commercial and the com commercial fishing and commercial commercial muscling mm -hmm. uh, to really know exactly word for word what that regulation is. Uh, the guide is just our interpretation, how we need to get that out to the public and uh, to get the information we think you need to fish and, and legally harvest fish in the state of Tennessee. So. And as we find things that do need to be changed, we, we try to update the electronic version on the website. We do, so. and that's, mm -hmm. that's been a big help to be able to do that. But uh, once these are printed, uh, we go through them for about two months trying to get them right, but they they always end up with a, a few yeah. changes that need to be made or corrections. And yeah. that goes for hunting too, because I mean, uh, check your proclamations on that and 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 uh, dig into those and make sure uh, stuff's right there on the hunting guide. Because we had a few misprints on it this year, and that's just how it how it, it happens. Goes. Happens. Um, 
All right, well, let's jump into the sport fish proposals that we heard at the commission meeting and try to highlight these for the folks at home. And um, right there off the top, uh, Region 3 seems like they've got quite a few uh, sport fish proposals and things going on that, they, that we want to maybe a change in Region 3, Watts Bar Reservoir, something to do with paddlefish. Tell us a little bit about that. Um, on Watts Bar Reservoir, um, paddlefish season, the snagging season, has uh, traditionally been the same as the statewide. Uh, we changed the krill limit there a couple years ago from two fish a day to one. Um, and we're still having issues. Uh, we're, we're making some cases on over the limit there. We want to protect those fish because what happens, those fish run out of Watts Bar up to Fort Loudon Dam and they're con they congregate there. They're restricted in movement upstream uh, by the lock and dam. They can get through the lock at times, but uh, with the operation of that lock and dam, they are restricted there below Fort Loudon Dam. And uh, so we uh, was thinking really hard of what we could do there, and we've had a uh, pretty good paddlefish fishery there on Cherokee Reservoir, and we, we had some changes to it last year, and those seem to be working for us. So we're, we're looking to mimic those changes on Cherokee there below Watts Bar okay. to add some further protection for paddlefish. And what that'll do, it will restrict the paddlefish season on Watts Bar from May 1st uh, through May 15th. And there'll be a closure of two weeks before and two weeks after that. Uh, so, and that closure is not for the entire uh, water body of Watts Bar, it's for that small section from uh, US 321 bridge, the new bridge that they built there below Fort Loudon okay. uh, Dam, up to the dam. And you won't be able to, to, to snag for paddlefish in that except for that two week season of May 1st through um, May 15th. Okay. And then uh, let's see, there's some stuff on Big Loss Creek, Gopher, Gopher Creek and Spring Creek, Greasy Creek, those are some cool names. Uh, yeah. What's going on there? It's in, in Terpeteries in Polk County. Those. Those creeks uh, have been under, uh, they're in our spring trout stocking program. And for years, uh, due to the limitations we had at, from our, at our hatcheries, stocking fish into some of those creeks, we had to uh, ask for some assistance from our law enforcement folks. And uh, our law enforcement agents would help us out in hauling some trout into those creeks and stocking them on Thursdays and Fridays. Mm -hmm. And just like Teleco, uh, those are very small roads up there in that area that's mm -hmm. around those creeks and access is kind of limited. So we wanted to uh, take some of the pressure off. So we closed it on Thursday and Fridays. Uh, and then the fish were ready for everybody to, to go up there on Saturday and Sunday and, and enjoy their weekend. Right. Uh, with some of the changes we made at our hatcheries, we feel like that uh, we can handle those stockings and that uh, we're we're moving forward with taking that off and allowing a little more fishing opportunity in those streams and uh, so opportunities on on the thursdays and fridays yeah, yeah. okay so awesome um a and lot they'll of, be managed under our statewide trout our wild trout regulation just like a lot of the the streams in cherokee national forest so okay um and then up in teleco let's look there's a teleco Sitico permit requirement uh dates for teleco river for its uh, confluence with the turkey creek upstream to the north or to tennessee north carolina state line um so what's all that about right there well <clears throat> we've experienced a lot of issues with warming water um there in the teleco area over the last probably five to ten years um i remember when i first got here that there was issues with uh, the teleco permit area that during as the summer went on as as weather uh, temperatures increased uh, the water temperatures increased mm -hmm. up there and and trout require cooler to cold water to survive and for them to really bite and our anglers to have a really good experience catching trout that water those water temperatures need to stay low so what we've found over the last five to ten years is that we continually are having to shrink that permit area, the stocking area where we're putting fish out in July, August, September, and it really doesn't meet up with our permit time frame. 
So in in 2016, I believe we actually had to uh, 16 or 17, we actually had to move almost every trout out of Teleco Hatchery uh, early in July and close down the stocking altogether up there mm. until October, late October, mm. because of those warm water temperatures and low water. Uh, so to avoid some of that and to provide a good fishing experience for our anglers, we've decided that we're going to change that permit um, time frame. And we're going to shorten it up a little bit, but we're going to add a couple weeks in March. So we're going to go from March 1st through August uh, 15th there at Tele- on Teleco and Sitico in that permit zone and uh, should help with the, uh, the stocking and the experience the angler's going to have. They pay an, an extra fee for that permit and, and what that does, we provide a better fish up there in the Teleco, Sitico. Uh, most of our stock trout streams and our tailwaters across the state, we try to get a nine to 10 inch fish put in. There we're looking at a 12 to 14. Mm. And the guys up there over the years have done excellent work of producing those larger fish. Uh, about three years ago, we, we uh, worked with Irwin National Fish Hatchery and we were able to pick up some of their retired brood fish mm. and we moved those on station there at Teleco and we uh, sprinkled those into our stocking so you're, <laughs> you're talking about an 18 to 20 inch fish at times right there and they call them the Teleco trophies they've even got a, a name there in that Teleco area huh. that they're known as the, t- the Teleco trophies that's so cool it's really added a new uh, new flair to the Teleco Sitico experience that has been a tradition with a lot of people for a long time up there well, uh, for the sake of time, there's uh, go watch the commission meeting. There's some other stuff going on around Teleco and Teleco River that you probably want to to learn about. Uh, but let's let's jump on down to Region Four. Uh, there's a uh, we're adopting a krill li- limit or a krill uh, limit and length limit uh, on game fish. So we jive with North Carolina Commission. Can you explain that a little bit? Yeah, Calderwood Reservoir is a reservoir that that falls both in Tennessee and and North Carolina. And most of the access is located in North Carolina. And um, so we've had a a couple of regulations that's been different over the the years there. And we just feel like uh, we're working more with North Carolina to allow access through our reciprocal license agreement. And we just felt like it'd be a good time to go ahead and adopt the regulations for the majority of the reservoir and go ahead and manage those under the North Carolina regulations. And uh, it just makes it simpler for our anglers and uh, and the management of the, of the reservoir in, in general, mm-hmm. if we're all talking the same numbers. So, all right, and then statewide, there's going to be um, uh, any fish that is landed with the aid of a gaff will be considered as a harvested fish. Explain that. Well, traditionally, I don't think gaffs are used very much in freshwater fishing. You may have to explain a gaff for me. I'm okay. not 100% a, on that. A gaff is a, a stick or a small. Um, uh, handle that there is a sharpened hook to the end of it and okay. they're used a lot in salt water to land really big fish it okay. just gives you leverage on that fish but most of the time when you land a fish with a gaff it's a mortality mm-hmm. you, you're you're gonna going take to it home. you have decided that you're going to take that fish home it's big enough yep. that you need a gaff you're going to take that fish home and you're going to harvest that fish it's not meant for catch and release so We've been made aware that there's been use of gaffs when, especially during the snagging season when you're, you're snagging these big paddle fish and you want to make sure you get them in because you've not right. got them lift in the mouth. You may have them lift in the tail or, or wherever. Right. And we've been made aware that people are using gaffs. Mm-hmm. And with our no call, uh, when you decide you're going to harvest that paddle fish or that fish you've snagged under the no call, we don't want that fish to be injured any more than than it was during the the, pot, the process of catching it. Right. And when you decide, okay, I'm going to call that fish or I don't want to harvest this fish now, I want to continue fishing, and especially with the one fish limit. So mm-hmm. we've decided that, okay, if you if you decide you need to use a gaff, then you need to harvest that You've fish. You've committed. We don't want yeah. Yeah. you to injure that fish uh, beyond the point of, of a, a good, safe release and then uh, – release it back so okay we feel like if you if you decide you need to use a gaff you've decided that you need to harvest that fish at that point and it becomes part of your your krill right all right awesome well um 
uh, for the sake of time also we're about to run out of time and we're gonna have to to rush through these or at least uh, you can go online and watch the the commercial fishing part. But let's hit the bait proposals because that's a big okay. thing. And yeah, that, that's an important one. And we've got a few questions coming on Facebook about uh, Asian carp and that kind of thing. And then some of this bait stuff hits some of that, probably some of those questions. So just elaborate on our bait restrictions that we're trying to put into effect to even help stop Asian carp from coming into some waters. Okay. Uh, as more and more Asian carp move into the Tennessee and the Cumberland Rivers, uh we're starting to see some smaller fish. We're not seeing really small three, four inch fish. Those three, four inch Asian carp really look a lot like gizzard shad, threadfin shad, and possibly skip jacket small sizes. And the, the way that shad are harvested with cast nets and, and shad scoops and things like that, there's the possibility that you would get those small Asian carp. And what we don't want is people going to these areas where we have shad and, and Asian carp intermixed, collecting those and then moving them uh, during a fishing trip or, right. or something like that to one of our tributary impoundments that they have no other way of getting to. Uh, they can move through the locks fairly easy, mm -hmm. but a lot of our dams don't have locks on them, uh, some of the highland dams, and we don't want Asian carp spread across our state as bait. So we're looking to restrict the movement of, of bait fish especially shad, um, well, only shad, uh, both gizzard shad and skipjack. Okay. Or and thread, thread fin. And thread too. fin, yeah. yes, and skipjack herring. Uh, we don't want those fish moved uh, from uh, Kentucky Lake, Pickwick, and Barkley, and the Mississippi River. Uh, there's a lot of small Asian carp on the Mississippi River, and we don't want fish moved from there further inland into our state. All right. So we're going to restrict it from there. When you see those small fish uh, compared, side, even side by side up close, you know, it, it's really tough. Unless you're really looking close, it, it can be very, very, very easily mistaken. And shad are hard to keep alive, so you want to get those out of the net into the bait well as quick as you can. You right. don't have a lot of time to look at those. So, all right. Well, we covered a lot here today, and there's still a lot more to uh, read through and and uh, and learn about so the easiest way to, to learn about all that is to go watch the commission meeting and it was uh they're also on our on the website i saw the press release went out today yes those, so. okay check the check the newsroom read the press release um and also uh, watch the commission meetings if you want to hear the full story there and uh, uh jason thanks for being here and, and highlighting this for us uh we appreciate that and, Thank you uh, for having me. Don't Thanks forget for your time. Yeah, don't forget the comment period. So um, email fishingreg.comments at tn.gov. And then if you want to mail it in, uh, it's 40747 Nashville, Tennessee 37204. So, all righty. Thank y'all. Thank you. Thanks, we'll see Jason. you all next time right here on Tennessee Wildcast. Thanks for tuning in. Stay connected with TWRA by visiting our website at tnwildlife.org. And follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Hey, it's all about Tennessee wildlife. It's what we do. Tennessee Wildcast will be on the air again next week. We'll see you then.